dos últimes intervencions, la de Susan Meisselas i Kader Atia, després d'haver escoltat Ariela i François Vergès amb excel·lents contribucions al debat, que volem replegar i volem sintetitzar amb una última taula després de la intervenció de Kader Atia. Per tant, encara ens queda un bon recorregut i esperem que amb intervencions de mitja hora cadascú, half an hour intervention, something like that, podrem, com dic, sumaritzar i finalitzar amb un debat que ens doni temps suficient per entrar en detall i poder compartir qüestions d'aquí del públic. Gràcies. Thank you, Susan. Very sorry, everyone. Computers almost speak to each other, but in fact don't. There was no PowerPoint on this computer, which is the only one that links, so... Um, so I'm going to take you on a different kind of journey. When I think about uh, Ariella's journey, you have a lot of work to do. I just want you to know. I only was there for an hour. It's a fantastically deep experience. So take the time. And she took 10 years, I think. Uh, she's given us a great gift, but it's deep. And it will take you a long time to, to cipher even as much as she's given us. And Francoise, all I can say is I wish I could see the Imaginary Museum. And maybe someday that will happen. This is a different kind of journey and it'll probably be easier for some of you to follow my path. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really trying to just share a process. And in sharing a process, um, the kinds of questions that that come to me as a practitioner going out into the world not knowing where, will le where I will be led. Um, this image wasn't made by me, but it was 1991. So I'm gonna start you almost 20 years ago with the Kurdish mass exodus, not the one that you most recently have heard about from across the border of Syria as the Turks were bombing, but um, this was under Saddam uh, in Iraq. So I have to temporality place you back, some of you hopefully were born, though not all of you. Um, uh, so let me see how I'm gonna coordinate this. Um, just trying to get reoriented because this is about being compelled to go somewhere where you actually are moving your body in a different way. And it's, I think a lot about the connection between a body and an archive and the way your body is your archive essentially. And you're carrying your history wherever you go. We felt that with Ariella and Francoise and I think you'll feel it in a different way from me. In this case, I'm crossing a border, uh, Iran-Iraq border, um, and I'm going into the area that the Kurds have just fled from. So we're back at the time when Saddam is in power, um, and I think going into the world is different than and going into the field, as it were, as I talk about it. In some ways, it does have parallels to an archive. You don't know what you're going to find, what you can recover. You don't know how long you'll need to stay or even how often you're going to return. So in some ways, that, that there's an interesting parallel there. Um, in this particular short intervention, I'm really going to try and break this process into four stages of a kind of discovery and engagement and an evolving concept, um, which is really an ongoing process. So the chapter beginning in a sense of documentation from an evidential point of view, um, moving to a notion of collection, and then repatriation through multiple forms. So when I say documentation at this point, this is the Anfal campaign under Saddam. The report had been that 4,000 Kurdish villages had been destroyed. This is a town called Kaladiza of about 70,000, which had been systematically leveled. And though one heard about this, one had, it was difficult to see. I know this is hard to believe, but there was a time when there wasn't the internet. And you didn't get these pictures flying in your face. So you had to go somewhere to, to see. And in this case, I'm really searching for kind of visual evidence. The bullet on the back of this young man, Tamor, the only survivor of a mass village. So the onfall was unleashed by Saddam with the desire to annihilate the Kurds. So what can you see? What can you render um, the clothing 
wrapped around the bones that are buried anonymously in a grave. The grave with cement blocks circling, marking for the village the death of 33 men. Um, the execution of a town uh, called Kareme. And digging is, in a way, uh, what became the metaphor for this project, because in the process of literally the digging of the Koreme, documenting the exhumation process, I started to realize how little I knew and how much I had to find out. And this question of how do you, how do you recover the past when you're photographing the present as a photographer, I suppose that's kind of one of the big shift points. Who was I making these pictures for? What was the purpose that they might have in some notion of future? And the way skeletons like photographs are missing all the muscle and the membrane and, and certainly the stories that surround them. And that led to a kind of shift in practice. Seeing the photographs that people were holding, I began to imagine this concept of wondering if I could recreate a visual history through photographs. So it begins in a sense with stories that I'd been told by the Kurds of how many foreigners had come in and out of Kurdistan over the last century. Of course, they took pictures and they took those pictures away. So I kind of began to see myself in a timeline of image makers in this particular place. Um, in particular, this is the album of a young woman. She's the woman on the left with a hat. Next, uh, Lynette Sohn, she was 19. She brought a camera. She was married to Connell Sohn, who's under the British flag. He's overseeing Mesopotamia. And next to him is Adela Khanum, who's the Kurdish leader of that region at that time. So, of course, in a, in a way, um, this, <laughs> this is the picture that could be taken by a missionary. It could have been made by a colonial administrator of an anthropologist. I start to think of all the people who've come and gone and what those intentions were and how the photograph kind of marks their relationship. So the, um, this is sort of an uh, ev more evidential of a process that begins, which is uh, finding photographs photographing the photographs in one stage, but also reproducing the photographs, trying to find out who's in the photograph and what was the occasion, the event that created the photograph, and beginning to work with a network of scholars throughout both parts of Kurdistan and also in the diaspora in, in France and Sweden and Germany, uh, the US, etc. And through their knowledge base, in reintegrating uh, information, but essentially, the core idea was that each photograph I would, found, I would find would be an encounter, understanding that the photograph was an encounter of a relationship, both outsiders, insiders, whoever was making them. And together, these, these photographs were really going to reveal a history of, of that, of representation. So it, this next stage that I'm referring to of collecting is also repatriation. So I'm finding photographs in the National Archives and the Public Record Office in London, the National Archives in the US, um, Bibliothèque Nationale, the large institutions. And as I bring back either the Xeroxes, you just saw something like that, um, families began to open up the collections that they had amongst them. And so this movement across borders, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and through the diaspora, and principally in Europe, was this question of what I could research and what I could bring back. Um, the bring back was the key question. These were, th this was a history that was essentially buried in archives and not known as, as, um, as well as it could be. So this is a simple, uh, what's really a police camera that's used for evidential work. So I'm reproducing, rather than making my own photographs at this point, I'm beginning to share what I found with various families, through villages. We're using a positive negative film that sadly doesn't exist anymore, but Polaroid. This would make everything very transparent as a process. So somebody would share a photograph from their family collection. Um, all the details could be put on the positive so that you, know, you see the positive. They know that they've contributed to what becomes a collective history. And it's making this, this, this visibility, I think, is an important idea. 
um, to build the collective history. You have to have trust. I didn't know what I was making. I didn't know what I would find. I didn't know what it would add up to. But I'm gathering the stories around the photographs as, um, and trying to contextualize them. And the kind of photograph we're talking about could be as frail as this one. Um, so yes, there's some sense of protecting some notion of a historical memory that, that uh, you know, against the total erasure. Uh, this is um, the questions that were, you know, who's in the photograph, who might have made the photograph, who's, who kept the photograph, helped the so photograph survive. So it's a narrative of these fragments. It's not anything, um, it's not an authoritative account. It's more like a, a mosaic. Um, and certainly that the process, though, was the emphasis on the materiality of the artifacts themselves. Another important thing to say is this is at a time, and it's still true, sadly, is there is no homeland for the Kurdish people. Obviously, they're splintered, not only in the diaspora, across that region, across borders. So no homeland, therefore no national archive where all of this work might live someday, even today. But studio photographers, interestingly in the region, of course have those town's histories uh, embedded in their collection. So I began to kind of think about, I was tracing this imagined community and each image was opening up more layers. An example of which is this in Kazakhstan, the man who offers the photograph is, wants me to know about all of who these people became, not who they were, not the event of the photograph, but that they had ongoing lives. And that's really something that I think is resident in what we were just talking about or hearing about. For Francoise, of course, it's it's the oral history; um, it's not a written history. So who they who they have become, and in Russian you could read that one's an engineer, one's a lawyer, one's a pharmacist. Or the histories, both of the photograph, the occasion of the photograph. This is under Khomeini, um, a, a number of Kurds executed finding the mother of these two boys in LA who can recount what her supposition is as to why they were assassinated at that point in time. So these stories that live behind stories and that get carried to different regions was very important to this process also. And then, you know, what, when I say frag a narrative of fragments, it's bits and pieces. And the documents are legible, <laughs> they're dense, sometimes they're, they're blackened, and sometimes those are my highlights. Um, I'm making scrapbooks, and each time you see a little yellow post-it, that was a, re a response from the community as I moved around with this accumulating scrapbook. It ended up, I think there were five in the end, um, to try and get readings back of what I was finding and the relationship I could make between images and text. So I'm responding to this network of scholars, both regional and international, and thinking a lot about what the Kurds themselves had as they were forced to flee. So this is now another stage, the stage then of bringing it together in a form that's a book. Of course, it's linear, it's fixed, it feels kind of, um, in some ways, uh, it's the only place all of this work and these intertwined histories can live together. Um, but, you know, there are 24 million Kurds and their minority communities spread around a region, and this is a book that gets banned in Turkey. But it's telling each, I think, the representation, the, the, the choice to have the feeling of time in this book is quite important not just as a chronology, but also seeing the, the color shifts between the, the warm tones becoming cooler tones, the kinds of counterpoint stories. Um, the book was called Kurdistan in the Shadow of History. That's an ad, for example, for the autofocus camera of the Canon. The Kurds are simply part of the scene. This is the spread where the work I did was in the New York Times. And of course, there are ongoing and ongoing headlines. The book came out in 1997. 
And I think what's, it, it's hard to believe, it was hard to believe that within 10 years, um, the situation would be so different. Just to give you a feeling of these multiple perspectives on a page, the top image is from the Royal Air Force photographing themselves dropping bombs on the Kurds in 1924. The yellow, uh, in s what sits below was, was literally let, um, released as the bombing mission began. They released a document that said, we're about to bomb you and you should take cover. I mean, it was kind of strange warning and that came from a, Curtis fa a Kurdish family. The other kind of way of contextualizing images where there are no captions were these kinds of documents. Um, you could read this today. The PKK is a violent separatist organization attempting to create a separate homeland in southeastern Turkey. I mean, this is a document from uh, 1970, I believe. And yet, of course, the situation goes on. So I'm working uh, with these artifacts moving from the, f the physical object of a book and bringing the artifacts into an exhibition form. And it's an interesting question. We can go back to the authenticity of the artifact. For me, the artifact had to speak. The artifact had to be there to feel their presence as survivors. Um, so the, the exhibition went from contemporary museums to the Museum of Ethnography in Hamburg um, across from Holland to France, wherever there were minority communities of, of significant um, number. And with that was the idea at each time to create a site-specific room where the exile community could bring their photographs to the walls. Um, and, you know, again, this is 19, I think this one is a photograph from the reading room in uh, Holland, in uh, Rotterdam, the NFI. Um, and as people brought their photographs, it was just on the cusp of the possibility of the internet being able to not only transfer data, but also transfer visual documentation. So the idea came to me to make it, to be able to upload and create a website that would mean people would have continuous, the continuous opportunity to, to contribute. So it would be this ongoing cultural exchange between archivists and ethnographers and whomever from the region based on, as you can see, the dots, the, the geography or the timeline. Uh, this was called AKA Kurdistan in 1998. So the circulating of images via the internet made it a participatory and interactive process, essentially a virtual archive. In a sense, uh, you know, AKA Kurdistan now is really an artifact of a, of a process itself because it was a one-way street. It's not the two-way street. It, this was before iPhones and being able to upload instantly, before Google Maps, et cetera. But I think the thing that's interesting is we wanted to not just share photographs. We wanted to share stories. We wanted voices to tell their stories. And that was really a way to kind of counteract this suppressed history. Um, and we assumed it was only going to be safe in cyberspace. I think that's, that was one of the big surprises, that essentially it was not safe. Um, it was hacked numbers of times by the Turkish forces, gummer, unknown figures, um, still denying the rights of the Kurds to have their history in any form. So it took 10 years, and another 10 years which was again unimaginable that Saddam would be dead and the president of uh, Kurdistan at the time was actually is again a Kurd. So I went back to the region with a book that had Sarani, the dialect, um, principal dialect in Iraqi Kurdistan to bring the book to public libraries, schools. Um, so it's within this notion of a circle of return the book having been banned before, it was only carried by exiles, maybe perhaps before that. So this is 2007, 2008. And with bringing the back, back the book, we also brought back a different kind of exhibition, this time pages integrated with Kurdish writing in the interrogation, the former interrogation headquarters of the Iraqi um, military. 
So this was a newly formed um, cultural center in Sulaymaniyah. Um, what was interesting in a way was that the people who came were making the photographs of the past, thinking that they wanted to recover them, and that's what they were uploading by this time on Google Maps, which I still find to be a fascinating uh, process, um, rather than themselves as selfies, etc. at that time. Of course, maybe now they would be doing that. So I think a lot about the difference of making a frame as a photographer or creating a framework for the contributions of others. This, the migration then of the, what was an AKA Kurdistan map, which you see on the canvas there, and a sampling of some of the original materials, then became these storybooks. So those stories transformed into storybooks, and that was the next expression of it. Um, just trying to coordinate here. And I think the thing that, again, surprising in 2014, maybe it shouldn't have been in retrospect, but now we can see, as you may have noticed right before, on the map there, I'm using the map that was the declared homeland from the Kurds in 1945 uh, in, at the time of the League of Nations. And that's the map that's forbidden to represent in Turkey. So when this show goes up in Istanbul, I erase the borders. And what we're creating is now the borderless map with the storybooks going from the region progressively into the diaspora. And each time I do the show now, the no more storybooks are added. When we were in Barcelona, I don't know, Jessica, how many stories we added? Eight or 10 stories. We went to 11 in Rome. Uh, the, the exhibition that um, continues to carry more stories from each of those settings. Um, and, you know, I think this idea of organizing a workshop that is held maybe just a weekend before the actual exhibition is installed, and it's still amazing to believe it was just about two years ago here, and most of you would know your history two years ago, but it was pretty dramatic for us. We didn't know if anybody was even going to come to the opening, in that it was the, the president of the parliament was declaring independence, and therefore, of course, it was canceled, and many things have happened since. But, you know, that night was really um, powerful for all of us here. Um, this question of, of what the diaspora contributes and continues, can, can continue to contribute, whether it's reflections of the past or their, the realities of the lives they're living today. Um, I still feel that this process of someone else, someone telling a story they could tell a child but that would be held by a stranger is a very special moment in the triangulation that we live with in and around photographs. So the photographer, the photograph person, the viewer, each interacting, and so these little books that hang from that wall have started to become very, very special in the moments that people take to connect with others. This is the projection that's, um, and I, I guess I'll just end with this, I'm part of this history of image makers along with missionaries, military officers, and coloni colonial administrators, the collectors, and um, with some responsibility to of ongoing representation of others and many more questions about what we can contribute. So thank you.